we go. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. We're broadcasting live from our various quarantine zones across Brooklyn on this week's program. Vivek Chibber, professor at New York University, author of the ABCs of Capitalism. We're talking about what is capitalism, strategies for fighting it, the future of the socialist project, and good socialism, good liberalism versus not good socialism, not good wokeism. with Vivek Chibber, labor walkouts and solidarity with the uprisings against the murder, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We'll touch on that. Of course, we have a gem with David Griscom and I forgot to introduce Matt and David. My apologies. Matt and David, how are you guys doing? Matt's doing all right. Matt's doing all right. We still got, we got in some, uh, Technical hiccups this week, folks. Um, on the post game, Joshua Kahn Russell is talking about the actions in the Bay Area. Ben Burgess explains why Chris Rock had the best argument by analogy ever. Olaf Palm, we might find out who assassinated him tomorrow. Let's remind ourselves of what an extraordinary leader he was. Also, why calling to censor on the internet is a disaster for the left. Don't do that to Michael Moore's movie, regardless of what you think of it. We're gonna be covering all of that as well as Cornell West's distillu- uh, distillation of the democratic lesson, small d democratic lesson of today's moment. All that and much, much more on the Michael Brooks show. But first let's talk about the ongoing uprisings taking place across the country, the incredible uh, outpouring of courage, of commitment, and uh, the great potential as well as potential threats moving forward. Um, Across the country, demonstrations are ongoing and significantly in New York City, the authorities have backed down somewhat. They've ended the curfew after days of rampant and vicious NYPD abuse of protesters. However, United New York City has suspended habeas corpus. We don't know the state of that. In Los Angeles, the curfew is lifted. And there again have also been numerous instances of vicious policing and crackdowns the political ramifications are starting to play out in different ways. Bill de Blasio has indicated some small cuts for the NYPD. There is reform moves being pushed on the city and state level. And in Minneapolis, most significantly potentially, nine out of 12 city councilors in a veto-proof majority have voted to disband that city's police department. A concrete plan has not been developed yet, and we don't exactly know what that is leading towards. What does defund and dismantle actually mean? And now is a time to be extremely concrete about this. So it goes in a universalist, democratic, and truly just direction. We know the dangers that with regards to austerity, the absolute interest in private security interests and others into mobilizing this moment for the mercenary industry. And whether or not these cuts will turn into austerity or will they be turned into cuts of police departments and radical and deep funding of everything else. That's what we need to focus on right now. Defund the police is not just defund, it is slash and get rid of abusive, broken windows, systemically racist and classist policing and redeploy and redistribute money across other vital sectors, healthcare, education, and all other areas that are vital in states and localities. It also means breaking up different functions inside the police department. Of course you need people that investigate and deal with real crimes. But you absolutely do not need people policing communities, terrorizing and harassing communities, or 
being given the assignments to doing jobs that they are not able and did not even sign up to do, like social work or education. So we need to make sure that these moves don't mean that the money just gets taken away in an austerity drive, which we already see across this country. And that will be the counter move that you might see as this agenda gets embraced by a broader set of policymakers. We already know that we're about to see harsh austerity. New York City is facing a several billion dollar budget cut. And the private sector, which has already stepped up its efforts, we've seen as an example the co cooperation between one private billionaire giving the Baltimore Police Department essentially a drone program, which we've talked about on this program, uh, that the impulse to go towards austerity and privatization is a very real political formation right now. And we also see this in other areas of the world where there's significant problems of out of control, violent, racist, and brutal policing, including Brazil and South Africa. So the clear, clear policy agenda needs to be that that money is not going anywhere. That money is going to get redistributed and redeployed to health, education, jobs, and other community supported infrastructure. Then there needs to be the redesigning of the departments themselves so that different tasks are split up into discrete and distinct categories. And this is gonna involve treating the democracy and security of all as a fundamental right and not a privilege of any one race or class. We have seen the absolute viciousness of police departments that many people have been very aware of and have known because they've been on the receiving end of from the perspective of systemic racism for quite some time. And we've seen examples like this, the Minneapolis Police Department. We're gonna, let's play this clip of them cutting tires of, uh, do we have this clip of the Minneapolis Police Department cutting? Yeah. This is some protesters and news crews and medics in Minneapolis found themselves stranded after recent tests, uh, protests. The tires of their cars had been slashed. Many assumed the protesters were to blame. I didn't assume the protesters were to blame, but videos reveal a different culprit, the police. Watch this. These are police officers literally puncturing the tires of this car, people serving as medics during these protests. We need to get rid of all forms of lifestyle policing, all forms of so-called broken windows policing, which has been the dynamic that has facilitated the gentrification, redesigning, and absolute brutality in modern cities that have given rise and been the handmaiden of the real estate industry and extreme inequality. We need to get rid of that entirely. And we need to make sure that the budgets that remain are redeployed effectively and redesigned creatively inside the departments themselves. When aiming to dismantle a police department, we must be vigilant that the neoliberal religion of replacing the public with the of the public with the private does not lead to a rise in private policing, it would be disastrous. And if we achieve the goal of weakening the police force, we can only see a rise in policing tied to private firms used to terrorize on behalf of private interest. We need to also be extremely vigilant of the Democratic Party co-opting uh, the movement and building on symbolic reforms that don't get to the fundamentals. Now, the Democrats have put forward a bill that, as an example, would ban chokeholds. What kind of a disgusting, obscene society we live in that that wasn't already banded age ago, ages ago? And of course, we've also seen, as in the murder of Eric Garner, that bans do not stop police violence. Make it easier to sue police officers who unjustly injure or kill citizens, lower the federal threshold for when police officers can be charged with using excessive force, create a national police misconduct registry and racial profiling, limit the transfer of military equipment to police departments. These are all good things in and of themselves, but none of them amount to systemic and complete demilitarization 
as well as a redesign of policing so that these distinct categories are broken up between real crime that needs to be dealt with, things that should not be crimes at all, like the drug war, or areas that are best responded to by social workers, educators, and other community initiatives. The next chapter of this movement is yet to be determined. The social base is growing. There are countervailing forces prepared to absorb and redirect popular anger towards the reaffirmation of establishment power, both in terms of neoliberalism and even in terms of some of the most dangerous tendencies in policing itself. So we need to keep pressing on and we need to be prepared with the next phases of strategy. You guys have anything uh, to add? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, what you hit on is really important. And I would just add that what, you know, when we're talking about these, these movements and making sure that they, they don't get co-opted, this recent democratic bill is a great example of that in the sense that like, these are very important reforms and, and things that obviously need to be done. And they're pretty agreeable. Only like the most, you know, the complete lunatics are the ones who think that the police should have tanks in the streets, right? Like most people understand that that's ridiculous. Um, but what you can't, what we can't allow to happen is to let the Democrats get away with basically putting up that kind of stuff that, uh, you know, is it, just so absurd on its face um, that it shouldn't exist in the first place. You know, another example of this is like private prisons, right? Which are obviously horrible, disgusting. We shouldn't have, you know, for-profit prisons. Um, you know, but those are all also represent, you know, small portion of the prison population and the prison system, right? So we need to make sure that like, Yes, you know, get these reforms that are easy to do um, and are agreeable to most people through. Absolutely. Uh, but don't let don't let them basically like draw all our, all our energy um, towards towards things that aren't going to hit at the fundamental issue. I mean, like the fact is, is that, you know, it's these police officers murdering people um, in the streets with their bare hands, oftentimes not using tanks. Right. They're not using the military equipment to do to do these horrendous acts. It doesn't take uh, that kind of. Uh, militarization to have that happen. So we just need to keep our eye on the ball basically and not allow people to distract us um, with easy victories because we need big ones. We need big ones. And everybody wants democracy and security. Mm -hmm. And those are core building blocks. And the point is, is that for so many people, predominantly, of course, in poor, lower income and black and brown communities, the police are not a securitizing or democratic force. That is the fundamental thing that needs to happen. That's why you'll see contradictory poll results that on one hand, there's a significant lack of trust in the police for obvious reasons, but also in other cases, a desire for the police to do more as an example, like solving serious crimes, like murder. Mm -hmm. This needs to be exactly the point of the message and that you know, security and democracy are not a question of privilege. They're a question of core rights for all and that's exactly what the fight needs to be about. And that's also why it cannot be solved in a libertarian austerity direction either, because it's not a question of cuts and redeployment and, you know, leaving areas, uh, you know, to either quote unquote fend for themselves or distributing funds for the private sector. It is about making something that is, should be an has never been historically some form of a public good, a actual public good for all. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's going to be the important part of the messaging because obviously we know the argument, right? You, you defund the police department to move funding into important social programs. And I think, like, I think the reality is most people do want strong social programs. They want to get something for their yep. tax money. Um, you know, that's a very popular idea. So I think making sure that we're hitting on that as much as possible too, is going to be very important to say, you know, we want to actually provide a lot more to the community, um, things that have not been provided to the community for so long, because it's all been going to, uh, you know, basically having armed people wander around your streets all the time. We don't want that anymore. We want to read, we want to divert that money. Basically, you can't just say to people, we just want to take every, we just want to take things away, right? You want to also have that positive message, right? Which I think is happening more and more, but it's just, it's like, as we're making the argument, we need to make sure that, you know, we're making a conscious effort to hit that as much as possible. Definitely. Matt? 
I think Matt's uh, Matt's uh, Matt's still there, but he's uh, a little unstable. So he can't okay. I thought on. Matt was was dropping in because I I saw the uh, the mute button go away. So <laughs> I thought we were going to get a message from Leck. All right. Oh here we Matt. go. <laughs> All right. Matt. Oh, oh yeah. It's that's... not coming through. Okay. Coming well, through. I, if you can't hear, Vivek is on the line. Okay. Did that come through. Oh, yeah, Vivek is on the line. Okay, let me yeah. just do a really brief pitch, and then we'll bring on uh, Vivek Chibber. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet, guys. Uh, the way this happens is obviously through you becoming a patron, patreon.com slash TMBS. There's over 600 episodes it's, uh, from post games to illicit histories on every topic from, uh, I mean, Jesus, there's so many talking about uh, Thomas Sankara, Patrice Lumumba. Uh, we have a two-part episode on the 80s in Pakistan, the relationship between the CIA, the Mujahideen, and the ISI. We just did a two-part episode with Mark Ames on Russia, the Yeltsin re-election, and the global PR industry in the age of neoliberalism. Um, you get a huge amount of extra content and you make everything we're doing possible. Go to patreon.com slash TMBS. If you're a 21 and above patron, you make our docs possible, uh, the, uh, the video docs, and everybody who is a patron gets the Tuesday post game and Sunday episodes. And we're excited about what we do and we appreciate everybody coming on board. And uh, now we'll welcome to the program, uh, Vivek Chibber. Uh, I think, can you hear me now? I think he just drew off again. I think he's waiting for our, our old start time. So we got a little bit more to plug if I'm okay. still coming through. Our, um, but yeah, big guests coming up. I'll just continue the plug. Um, Go for so it. There's uh, next week, uh, obviously, the Chomsky interview. Let us know um, what you want us to ask him in these times. I know his... Uh, one of his assistants said he's interested in literary questions. So I feel like I was invited to come up with a literary question for Noam Chomsky. Wow. I love it. Frankly, intimidating um, uh, task, but uh, I'm going to prepare for it. We'll talk about, I'm sure we'll talk about Brazil and Lula. Yeah. That's something, obviously, Noam Chomsky was a big advocate on freeing Lula. So that's something. And then, of course, just everything that's happening in the country today. Mm -hmm. um so yeah we've also got additional conversations with cedric johnson which i'm really excited about william shockey of africa as a country is going to be joining us in a couple weeks talking about the south african security forces post-apartheid and this global struggle for me demilitarizing police and understanding basically how we can actually do it um he'll bring us the south african context for it as well so Join, get on board. The Vic's here. The Vic is here. Great. This is uh, we go straight to it now. We don't even have that break. <laughs> the Vic, are you there? I am. Do I have the camera on? You, you do not have the camera on. We hear you loud and clear, but you don't have the camera on. I have to figure this out. Hang on a second. No worries. Okay. There you are. Fantastic. Vivek Chiver, professor of sociology at New York University, author of numerous books, including the ABCs of Capitalism Guide, which we're going to be talking about along with other things tonight. Vivek, thank you so much for joining us on TMBS. It's my absolute Uh, been watching you for a long time, so it'll be fun to talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. There was a delay, but actually now you're back. Ah, um, okay. Sorry yeah. about that. We're having, we've had tech issues tonight like we've never had before. But mm -hmm. um, there's something going on with the cloud services, I think. There's something going TYT on with the TYT was clouds. having issues too. TYT was having, well, if TYT was having issues, then of course that's going <laughs> to flow out to even us, a smaller fish in the sea. Um, but Vivek, I do hear you, and I'm really honored to hear that feedback. And I'm just wondering, we'll, we'll do our best to plow through here and hopefully have you back on many times uh, when the cloud is cooperating with us. But 
Can you define capitalism for us? We throw these terms around all day, but what do they actually mean? What does capitalism actually mean? In its very simplest, what capitalism means is an economic system. So it's not a set of values, it's not a culture, it's not an ideology, it's an economic system in which everybody is dependent on the market for their survival. And there's two main groups that we're talking about. One is uh, people who control actual production, that's the owners of enterprises. They're dependent on the market because they have to sell on the market to be able to get their money. And then the other group is people who work for them. And what they sell on the market is their labor power, their ability to work. So everybody's selling something. The poor are selling their labor services and the rich are selling whatever services and goods are made from those labor services. They sell them to the poor <laughs> who go out and have to buy them. And how does, how did the, what is the difference between understanding the capital class protecting its own interests in a way that is conspiratorial? They all meet in a secret room and, you know, sort of define, you know, they all know each other in a secret club, which actually, I mean, sometimes obviously that does exist. Uh, or like the corrupting influence of money in politics, which does exist, versus just the baseline self-interest of capital that defines everything. And it doesn't even need to be spoken about. It doesn't even need to be co coordinated. It's an organic interest that defines their interests every time, every place, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, if a system like this, this big, with so many billions of people in it, is going to keep going over time, it can't require explicit coordination. It can't. It would have collapsed by now. So the only way it can keep going along very predictable lines is if there are incentives in place for people to carry out their functions without having to be told to carry out the functions in that way at that time. So what are these incentives? They're incentives that every capitalist understands along economic lines, along political lines, and along ideological lines. Every capitalist understands them because they're crystal clear the only people who don't understand them is intellectuals. <laughs> Why don't intellectuals understand them? We'll come to that in a second. Okay. <laughs> it's a longer conversation. <laughs> um, that was the fun part. It's very simple. You go, you own an establishment, whether it's a factory, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a warehouse, you need to make money and you got, you're hiring people. And the only way you survive in that marketplace is if you keep your costs to a minimum and you keep your profits to a maximum. It's as simple as that, right? Now, in order to do that, there are a whole series of things that you're gonna to have to be able to complete, to accomplish. Those things include economic, political, and ideological activity. Economically, you're gonna to have to be able to bring people in. You're gonna to have to be able to get them to work for you at a certain pace, with a certain efficiency, and you're gonna to have to go out and sell those products to the community, to the population. Now, to get that work out of those people, they don't want to work for you. They want to be there. You've got to figure out a way of extracting it from them. That means you've got to exert power over them. So first of all, every capitalist knows there's a bottom line and I've got to meet it. There's a profit maximization imperative and I've got to meet that. And I've got to make sure I've got enough power over these people in my place to get them to do what I want them to do. And that power is both inside the workplace and outside, which means I've got to have political control over the state which means I have laws that help me. And ideologically, I need an ideology that tells these people either A, you're getting what you deserve and you deserve nothing more. Or B, if you don't like it, there's nothing you can do to change it. This is the law of nature. So and every but, capitalist understands this. And they don't need to be told that. Right. Every, so they understand this, but other people like intellectuals might say, wait a second. We have a democratic state and anybody can want run and anybody can win. And yeah, maybe, you know, we need to be careful of who's funding elections or this or that, but we have a neutral mechanism in place. So if you aren't, uh, if, if workers aren't organizing themselves on a neutral mechanism, then what does that tell us? Well, you said two different things there. One is about the state and the other is about why are workers not organizing themselves in some particular way. Right, fair enough, yeah, yeah. 
So let's let's just look let's, at the first one. Yeah, please. Is the, is the state a neutral mechanism? It's not, but it's also not simply run by a cabal of rich people who have total control over them. That was the case from the 1600s to the early 20th century. It was just a cabal of rich people who controlled the state because they were the only ones who had the right to vote. So literally, if you were wealthy, you had the right to vote. If you got elected into office, you took care of business for yourself and for your brethren who had property like you. The, the kind of veneer of popular control comes from the fact that now everybody in principle has the power, the ability to have some say in the political system. But it simply comes down to this, it's a very simple rule. Is it the case that fighting in the election, running in the election, getting into office takes material resources? Is it or is it not the case? If that is the case, and only academics believe it is not the case. If it is the case, then it follows deductively that if material resources are distributed unequally, the ability to participate in the state will also be distributed unequally. Unequally, not, not exclusively. Right. So it is not the case that the cabal of the wealthy owns and controls the state. The, the poor do get some say in it. But what matters for class society is not that the rich have the only say in it. What matters is that they have enough of an imbalance in their say that they can protect their basic interests. So I think actually this is a really good context for what capitalism is. Can you then tell us what socialism is and what Marxism is as well? <laughs> sure. Uh, what, 10 words or less, right? Yeah, 10 words. Absolutely. Well, look, this is, uh, this is YouTube, so take 20. Uh, okay, this is, see, this is what historic progress looks like. You go from 10 to 20 words. Yeah. <laughs> we can't say what socialism looks like because it's an aspiration. Right. We can say what it has looked like, and we can say what we would want it to look like. What it has looked like has not turned out to be what people wanted it to look like. Now, you can think of socialism narrowly or expansively. Narrowly, you can say, well, the countries that call themselves socialist are the socialist ones. Okay, that would be the Soviet bloc, China, uh, countries like that. Well, we know what they, they look like. We know what that is. It's a centrally planned economy in which there's a one-party state, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, aspirationally, we know nobody wants that. Nobody on the left wants that. That's a nice historical, um, not, I shouldn't say nice. It's a particular historical model, particular historical experience, and we need to study it and learn from it. But nobody on the left today thinks it, and the evidence for that is red baiting is over. No, you can't be red baited anymore because even the right wing knows that the left today does not aspire to that model. All right, so then the second, the, the broader way of, of defining socialism is the way Sanders did, which is socialism is a set of institutions that embody a principle. And that principle is people before profits. Right. Now, those in, the institutions embodying that principle can be present even within capitalism to a greater or to a lesser extent. In countries like the Nordic countries, they were, those principles were institutionalized to an enormous extent. In the countries like the United States, they barely got a foothold. So the basic principle behind socialism is, I said capitalism is a system in which everybody is dependent on the market, which is a vicious, brutal system. Right. Socialism is a set of institutions designed to not have people's fates hinge on their, their uh, participation in the market. Key point, their fate should not hinge on their participation in the market. That does not mean that there's no place for the market. It just means that your fate doesn't hinge on it. it now, you can think of that in more or less ambitious terms. So a centrally planned economy was initially thought of as an economy in which you would just get rid of the market altogether, which means nobody's fate can hinge on the market. Turned out that didn't work. I believe it can't work. So the alternative then is to roll, push back the scope of the market like a disease to the extent that we can. You learn to live with it the way you learn to live with an incurable virus, but you learn to control it and you learn to minimize its damage. And in some cases, even perhaps gain from certain advantages it might give you. But the basic idea is, free people's fates from 
the vagaries of the market. Now, you wanted to know about Marxism. Yeah, I wanted to, but actually, maybe before that, can we, uh, just a quick, so, I, I'll and I'll borrow from our mutual friend, Bosker here, which is that it's undeniable the enormous achievements of the social democracies. I mean, that's, you know, it, it, and I think we actually need to spend more time acknowledging those great achievements because they are in fact great achievements and we can complicate them and we can locate them in a global supply chain and we can talk about their limits and all of these other very important things. But these countries delivered and still actually relatively speaking deliver much better kind of basic standards uh, than anywhere else. And at the same time, we've also seen this kind of broad rollback of the social democratic successes, say, starting in the late 70s up till today. And so, you know, if I'm understanding Bashkar correct, correctly, he'll say, you know, what sort of led me to Marxism and the idea of clawing more and more of the economy outside of that virus is because the rollback of the social democracies show that this virus is very hard to contain. So when we talk about containing it, what does it actually look like, particularly at a time when it's, you know, we've been having Corona capitalism for quite some time, right? It's sort of out of control everywhere and determining most of our landscape. Yeah. I think that um, one of the things we can um, draw on from the social democratic experience is this, that um, while none of them abolished private property altogether, they did um, minimize its scope to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the country. Let's just look at certain key sectors, uh, Michael, in our economy. Um, healthcare, transportation, the media. The days of uh, the old media model is broken. Um, we're gonna have to either have a publicly funded media or, or we'll end up with no newsrooms pretty soon. Yep. Um, utilities is another one. Okay, in any sane uh, bourgeois economy, even in a capitalist economy, these things should not be in the private sector. These goods and services should be distributed to people as citizenship rights. What does that mean exactly? It means you nationalize them. And we know we can because we have in the past. Now, suppose we nationalize these five key sectors. Depending on the country, we're talking about anywhere from 45 to 60% of the economy. You've taken 60% of the economy out of the control of capital. In doing so, you've not only given people access to these goods as rights, regardless of how much money they have, which is a huge democratic achievement, you've also dramatically reduced the political and economic clout of the capitalist class. Because what do they have to bring you to your knees at the end of the day when you try to enact progressive reform? What they have is the ability, which is like what I go into in my pamphlets, they have the ability to bring the economy to its knees because they control investment. And the economy is nothing more than flows of investment. But if you take half of it out of their hands, well, you haven't eliminated their power. They're still the most single most powerful group, but you've given yourself breathing space, right? So, we, so that's one way in which we can institutionalize this vision of pushing back the scope of the market, because it not only increases the stability, the security of people's lives, it also reduces the power of the wealthy to undercut these efforts when they decide they're not going to put up with it anymore. So what is Marxism and how does Marxism, if, if socialism is kind of our, some form of normative goal, people over profit, is Marxism like the machinery, the tactics, the strategy of how we do it? Um, it's related to it, but more specifically Marx. Think of um, socialism is the kind of car we want. We want a sports car that's got great power that goes zero to 60 in four seconds. Definitely. Marxism is the engineering that tells us how to make it. So socialism tells us where we want to be, what our goal is, what our vision is of a humane and just society. Marxism is a theory that tells us why that is not achievable in capitalism. What is it about capitalism that makes it unachievable. If it was achievable inside capitalism, we would not be anti-capitalist. So Marxism tells you why it's not achievable. And this is where the current left is the weakest it's ever been, because it has no conception of it. 
And Marxism tells you to some extent how to get there because fundamentally it tells you what politics is about. What, what makes Marxism distinguish, uh, distinctive as a political theory is that it says politics is fundamentally governed by material interests and the power, the capacity of people, their socially materially depend, uh, uh, depend, uh, uh, determined capacity to act on their interests, which is different from a moralistic account, which is different from a cultural theory, which is different from an individualistic theory. So Marxism fundamentally is a theory of how capitalism works, how politics is organized, how the economy is organized, why it systematically squelches social justice and efforts towards justice. Based on that, it follows, well, then here's what you have to do to get more justice for yourself. And unlike socialism then, for socialists, Marxism should be either taken or rejected. It's either right or it's wrong. So you have, a, I think socialists should have a very mercenary attitude towards Marxism, just like doctors have a mercenary attitude towards medical science. But socialism is our Hippocratic oath. It tells us what we're trying to achieve. So then what is the distinct position of the worker in this, if we flow out of that? In terms the distinct of position of the worker is this. The most powerful agency, the most powerful group of people inside a capitalist economy, a capitalist system, is capitalists. By and large, whatever they say goes. And people have to, everybody has to pay attention to them because everybody depends on them. The population depends on them for their jobs. Social institutions depend on them because all revenue comes out of income and all income comes out of jobs. And the state depends on capitalists because state's revenues comes out of taxation and taxation comes from income and income comes from investment and jobs. So you have a problem on the left. You want social justice, the wealthy say you can't have it. So you can beg and plead you can cajole, you can moralize all you want. White, black, brown, purple, or red, doesn't matter who they, what their color is, they're all driven by the same basic interests, right? The reason workers matter is because they're the only people who can bring these very powerful capitalists to their knees. And the reason they can do that is, you know, as everyone knows, their power depends, the capitalist power depends on their profits, but the profits can only come if people actually come to work for them. And if workers withhold their labor power, that brings the system to its knees in the same way as, as when capitalists withhold their investment. There's no other agency that can do it except the state. Problem is the state's controlled by the capitalists. So the two most powerful agencies in capitalism are the state and cap they're the two concentrations of power. Each is an alliance with the other. And the only people who have any capability of changing that is people who work for them. And you're going to see this happen now with all these calls to defund police and change the funding. Watch what happens. It's going to be very hard without a mobilized labor movement. Very, very hard. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I watch Andrew Cuomo's press conferences every day. Yeah. Pretty remarkable. Uh, within two days after the uh, mobilizations, around, after... Uh, George Floyd's death started, Cuomo comes out and he says, I'm with the protesters. And he says, um, the protesters don't want to get rid of the cops. What they want is to redirect that funding. And what's more, he says, even that's not enough. This is Cuomo, Dr. Neoliberalism, okay? This is Cuomo saying, he says, we need educational reform. We need housing reform. This is, okay, so he's already two steps ahead of where the movement was at that time. Now, here's the question. Once Cuomo and John Lewis and, you know, all these neoliberals come in and they say, we're going to enact reform, what is reform going to mean for them? What it's going to mean is two things. Uh, the austerity remains in place of the last 10 years. But in the crumbs that are going into the public budget, they'll take some of the crumbs that went into the police and they'll turn it into social services. What will Cuomo do when he says we need educational reform? There's two models. You vastly increase funding to public schools, which is the left. What's Cuomo going to do? Here's some charter schools for you. Right. Reform means, why charter schools? 
because that's what the balance of class power is going to allow you to do. You can say as a movement demand, which this movement is saying, and it should say, and it's a fantastic achievement. Stop pouring money into cops and repression, put money into social services, healthcare, et cetera. Who's going to do it? Why will they do it? That does not depend on demands stated along the lines they are now. That's going to depend. What you're calling on is a reallocation of budgetary priorities. A reallocation of budgetary priorities means changing the power balance amongst those groups who control the budget. Well, who sets the budget in a, in a state like the American state? It's not white people, it's rich people. And their servants are white, black, and brown. And watch what, you know what the most reliable servant of austerity with these cosmetic measures is gonna be? It's gonna be the Congressional Black Caucus. And that is because what it takes to change budgetary priorities is gaining leverage against the wealthy, whether those wealthy are black or white. And we're gonna watch this unfold over the next six or eight months. There's gonna be a lot of disappointment. I mean, I'm not criticizing the demands. They're, they're the, the demands the left ought to be making, but it's a very weak left right now. And it's also ideologically and strategically very weak. And it's got, you know, there's a decent chance that there's an end run that's made around these demands. So just as an example, we'll talk about this actually later on the show, but I want to mention this for you. One of the things that I found most exciting, and it, granted, this is obviously this is very small, but these longshore uh, workers um, are starting to basically say that they're going to do walkouts in support of these demands. That's an inkling of the direction you're talking about strategically. Absolutely. Okay. It, it's going to mean bo both a a move from the organized labor movement to support this. And I think sections of it are. I think very, most of the labor movement is very conservative and it's going to be very nervous about getting behind these demands. But more than that, uh, Michael, the, we're the organized labor movement right now is smaller than it was when unions were illegal right. in this country. So it really means it's going to require a deepening of what we've seen over the past five years in this revitalization bringing more of the labor force into the union movement. And that's automatically going to mean huge demands on the racial justice front because our labor force in this country is now in prime, almost majoritarian black and brown. So it, if that were to happen, it'll be a very big leap forward. The way forward is for every, uh, uh, all the cultural changes and by cultural, I'm talking about the very broad way of how we understand politics today compared to 10 years ago. These cultural changes brought about by the Bernie Sanders moment, Sanders pointing out that fundamentally, we're gonna to have to take on the wealthy, regardless of their color. That it's gonna come from organizing the poor and making the, that, that churning has to continue. And this moment we're in right now is, I, you know, I was curious to see where it would go. It is actually now coalescing with all the gains that were made under the Sanders moment. And I, the, if it continues in this direction and people say that we want budgetary reallocation and they see that those reallocations, Nancy Pelosi is giving lip service to it and people are going to come out wearing their dashikis and all that. It, it, what it's going to mean is they will watch this political class derail it, subsume it, uh, subordinate it, and that political class is going to be of all colors. And right. it'll be a learning moment that says, look, what really sets the agenda when you get down to it is who's got money and who doesn't. I was talking, we'll have him on the show soon with a journalist, William Shockey in South Africa. Uh, and we're going to talk, I mean, uh, about the policing situation in South Africa. And you're talking about, you know, one of the most important liberation movements in human history, this incredible, extraordinary accomplishment. And the ANC has absolutely not structurally changed policing in South Africa. Oh, you I can't think get away. Thing. Yeah. yeah. The, the derailing of the South African liberation movement happened at lightning speed. Yeah. In 19, you know, I, I, I was a student uh, 
in the late 80s, early 90s, when the anti-apartheid movement took off and I was active in it, everybody was looking at South Africa, looking to South Africa for two reasons. One was that it was the most militant, working class based liberation movement the world had ever seen. And so we were thinking, well, this will be the moment of decolonization, not just in Africa, but globally. That's fundamentally different from all the others. And because it's 1994, it would have been a huge boost to the global left, including the European left, it was very demoralized. By 1996, it was over. And who led the charge? It was black ANC members and communist party members. They went over by, to capital either by themselves becoming capitalist or by becoming their, uh, their aiders and abettors. We got whipsaw, it was so fast. So you consider that that situation, in that moment, that party caved with that working class and with Kosatu and the most well-organized labor force a third world country had ever seen. That gives you a sense of what we're up against in this country. So we have to be geared for the long haul. It's gonna be a very long, long process and there's gonna be a lot of setbacks. I wanna ask, I guess I'll, I'll get back to the weakness of the left in a second, but first is the sort of practical question about labor. So, I mean, anybody watches this show and the way you just outlined it, I, again, I think it's just, I don't, it's not uh, in the way you explained it as like a question of engineering disputable that a mass worker based is absolutely the most effective way um, and probably the only systemic way of confronting or countervailing capital, whatever way you want to put it. And then there is the very practical reality that you just said, that labor is decimated. Uh, the, there is a conservatism in what remains. I, I asked uh, President Lula, I, I always mention this because, you know, I asked him, I said, what would you do today if you were organizing and you had to deal with people who drove, you know, for Uber? You don't have central meaning places. There's no context for building relationships. And I mean, you know, he gave an extraordinary answer and he said he's terrified basically by Uber, but we're talking about, you know, an icon of labor organizing in the presidency. And, you know, he didn't have a clear answer yet as none of us do. So taken out of, you know, if we accept the premise, which I think we all do, that that's the site, but then we look at the amount of gains that capital has made in rolling it back. Do we have a sense of the sort of answer to that? in terms of how to revitalize it? No, but the good news yeah. is they didn't back in the 30s either. They stumbled onto it. Uh, when you're flat on your back and you're, you, the, the heel of the power centers is on your neck, of course you, you say, I don't know, how am I, how am I gonna get out of this? You haven't figured it out. That's why you're flat on your back. I would say this, we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which the labor force today is embodied in Uber. It's true. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work of this kind, but there's always been work of that kind in capitalism. And I'm not just talking about precariousness. Precariousness is built into capital. What I mean is these particular jobs where, as you said, there's no central meeting place, et cetera, et cetera. That's always been there. It's also the case that you're getting gigantic collections of labor again, but in different kinds of settings, like Amazon warehouses, transportation, in new sets of um, these supply chains that are opening up, they're smaller than they used to be, but they're also very vulnerable precisely because of the just-in-time delivery system, no inventories, uh, the importance of timing and logistics. So first of all, there are collections of labor that are still organizable in the old way. They're just not in factories, they might be in warehouses. Secondly, the power of labor may not have to depend on getting 60% of the labor force organized. You just have to get the strategically located sections of labor organized. And those are two, you know, green shoots, like two little rays of light uh, for us to hang on to. But it's important to understand that it, there's never been a time when the labor movement had a blueprint, which it then acted on to get labor organized. It made it up as it went along by seeing what was working and what was not. When the German Social Democratic Party was formed and was organized, it had nothing to build on. It made it up as it went along. 
I believe that could happen today. What it requires, though, is a left that sees that its lifeblood is poor people, not downwardly mobile professionals and university students. And um, yeah. that's not on the agenda right now. Yeah, I mean, explain, could you explain the weakness of the left? And you made a really nice synergy and tell me if I'm interpreting you correctly, but I really liked it because part of the paradox of my critique is that I'm, you know, whether we're calling it wokeness or PMC politics or whatever, there's all these elements and variants of liberalism that just always show up as a problem in terms of, you know, ideological, strategic, just, you know, sort of unappealing culture for building any kind of mass politics, this type of thing. And then on the other hand, it really strikes me, uh, particularly when we look at, you know, various historical examples, like someone like A. Philip Randolph, who I've been, you know, tuning into a lot recently, that, and, and, and even, you know, and, and you pointed out that sort of modern iterations of liberalism and socialism in different contexts are actually very encouraging in the sense that a fair amount of sort of substantive liberals started to recognize that their view of substantive individual rights for all was incompatible with, at the very least, unfettered capitalism. And increasingly socialists, you know, sure, there's this or that debate, and, you know, some of them are very worthwhile about the weaponizing of human rights discourse and, th and so on. That's extremely important. But almost none of us would seriously suggest that we're trying to create a political outcome that wouldn't allow for, you know, free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of substantive liberal rights. So there's this kind of interesting convergence, it seems to me, that actually could be politically very appealing, which is socialism and the expansion of the civic and legal, basically rights revolution of the 60s, in contrast with this sort of like constantly proliferating sort of, you know, identitarian sort of micro politics. Anyways, I don't know if I interpreted you correctly, but I'm wondering if that has something to do with the answer of the potential to, to rethink a better position left right now. Well, uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that socialism is basically a deepening of the promise that liberalism made to people. Socialism is an extension of the liberal philosophical and moral tradition. And we use liberalism in two ways. One is a liberalism that is committed to the defense of property and to the defense of this, the order that came up with property, the social order. Now that's a liberalism that of course, that's used in a pejorative and ne negative way and deserves to be. But there's another side to liberalism, which is, as you said, the, the realm of rights. Now, what is socialism other than saying that people have economic rights alongside the political rights? Furthermore, socialists say even the political rights in capitalism are undermined by the massive economic inequalities in the economic system. Because as I, said, as I said earlier, if politics requires and depends upon the mobilization of material resources, then if those resources are distributed unequally in the economy, it means politics will also be played out in a way where one side always has more power than the other. What the socialists say then is this, every life is as important as the other. It's called the moral equality of, of, uh, of individuals. But if we want every individual to have equal worth, then they should have an equal ability for flourishing, for acting out on their life plans, for meeting whatever goals they have in life, and that ability cannot be equal if they are in positions of domination and subordination to each other, which capitalism systematically creates. So socialism basically can be thought of as saying, we want to take the promise that liberals made, that Kant made, and that Hegel made, and we want to make it real. Now, the liberalism that you talk about, Michael, when you say there's a lot of liberalism within the left today, I would not call it that. So the identitarian stuff that you talk about, the narrowness, that is not an ideological hangover of liberalism. That is a very, very active set of people pushing their material interests. Right. The left in the United States is 
fundamentally and overwhelmingly a middle class formation. It is not a, it's the first left globally, historically, that has no connection to the working class, to the poor at all. People complain that the left is white, bullshit. That's a second, the left has, those non-whites who are in the American left are all middle class too. It's disproportionately white, but it's all middle class, regardless of its color. In that setting, when you're only bringing in middle class people into your organization, a big chunk of them are gonna say, we don't wanna hear about poverty. We don't wanna hear about the economy. We don't. What we wanna know is when we walk into a room, why are we not treated well? When we apply for the, the salaried positions at six figures that we think we have the right to, why do we get 5% less than the other guys? That's what the middle class on the left wants to hear about. It will dress it up in all sorts of historically powerful language and all that. But Adolf Reed has been saying this for a while and it's only because he's in America that people think this is controversial and the rest of the world, what Adolf says is just common sense, which is this is a form of nationalist politics and all nationalist politics has one or the other class character. Either it's a nationalism that's wrapped around the needs of the poor or it's a nationalism that's wrapped around the needs of the aspiring emerging elite within the dominant, dominated groups. Identity politics is the class instinct of black, brown, and Asian, yellow, whatever you want to call them, people, and the women. It's, it's not an ideological hangover. It is a very committed and clear set of material interests. And as long as the left remains in the middle class, it will never get out of it. Yeah, you know, it snapped together for me, actually, again, reading Adolf Reed. It's another South Africa example of looking at Tabo and Becky's move to the African Renaissance and just seeing like, okay, this makes a lot of sense that as soon as the ANC is not a project of labor and redistribution anymore, then the entire, you know, the only social project that remains, it's not even, I mean, it, it's fundamentally a criticism, but it's literally like the only project that could remain is to build a wealthy, African entrepreneur class because there's no other room there's no other room left you've handed macroeconomic policy to World Bank IMF you're not going to bring a wave of obviously primarily black people out of poverty from the apartheid era those structures economically are going to remain in place and you know here we go and again yeah, that, that you're going to dress it up as as um, black progress you're right. going to say that this, now look at look at all the industrialists we have it's I mean if the left were interested in actually learning from history, this is the entire history of the post-independence colonial world. It's aspiring elites taking over the movement, using the language of cultural difference, of racial uplift, uh, all this business to justify the creation of an entrepreneurial class and the hoarding of opportunities by the rising middle class, and then shitting all over the rest of the population and saying, look at us, look how great our achievements are. Right. The US yeah. is no different from that. So what happened? So I mean, then what's the move? <laughs> how, how does the left become? How does a, a show like this even, I'll make it as petty and trivial as that, but like how what what makes it so that there are thousands of Teamsters watching this or reading right. Jacobin or whatever? You know, what what is right. the move? Yeah. So I look, I would say this, Michael. I think where we are right now is in a much, much better place than we were at 10 years ago. That place is this, make a distinction between advances in the broader culture and advances in organized politics, okay? What's happened over the past 10 years is because of all the churning and the movements from, black, from Occupy through Black Lives Matter to the Bernie moment, which was really what made it explode to now, it's been a tremendous revitalization of certain ideas and certain aspirations, which had been killed by the new left these aging 68ers, they destroyed it and on the left and they, of course, behind them was standing the power of the business community. There's been a great now reawakening of certain aspirations. We all deserve better lives, that poverty is real, that the rich don't deserve to take everything and that whether you're black, brown or whatever, uh, you have certain things in common if you're on the bottom. That's what your show feeds on. That's what Rising feeds on. That's what the Young Turks and all these people feed on. And that's what this movement right now, this mobilization is 
pushing even further forward. But politically and organizationally, there's been almost no, no advance whatsoever. And the, the law, Bernie Sanders' loss, sadly, is, is a big setback. Yeah. It would have been a very big step forward if he, if he could have won. He would have been massively constrained, of course. But the thing about Sanders is he doesn't lie. He would have told you what the, what the, the, the lay of the land is, and he would have said, we're going to have to fight. What's happened is organizationally, we're very weak. The cultural advance right now can go one of two ways. It will either continue over the next five, six, seven years and gain traction, or it will be taken over by the Democratic Party and the foundations the way it always was. If it continues to move forward, then I think out of this culture, something could emerge organizationally. I don't think it'll come from the existing alphabet soup of the left. I don't think it's gonna come out of that. It's too mired in its old ways and its culture and its institutional settings and in its separation from the poor. But it might come out of the poor. And when it does, it will wash away the identitarianism because any left that's based in the poor in America is gonna be black and brown. It's not gonna be overwhelmingly white. And they're gonna look at these black and brown elites and they're gonna say, <laughs> um, we really have no need for you. We're not there yet though. Right. Vivek Chiver, I really, really appreciate your time. I hope you can return often. I'd really recommend everybody read. I'll just hold up one example. You can, there's really no excuse not to read this. Uh, <laughs> these are very readable, very accessible. Uh, and I'd also you can recommend. download them for free right now on the Jacobin website. So Download them for free on the Jacobin website. You should also watch uh, the Vex Stay at Home series as well. Uh, the Vec Chipper, I really, really appreciate that. This and and um, frankly, just like with Adolf, I appreciate uh, those of you who who have held the flame. Frankly, uh, <laughs> I'll put it like that. Listen, I, I wish I could leave it. You know, it's, it's like Brokeback Mountain. I wish I could leave it. <laughs> <laughs> it my life would be so much easier, but uh, I'm, I've got too much hatred in me. I think it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> that comes through and how great the writing is. Vivek Chibber, thank you so much. Thanks. And you're doing a, just, it's a really, really important show. And the world would be a much worse place w without this little niche that you guys, you and these other shows have carved out on YouTube. It's a fundamentally important contribution. So don't get discouraged in any way. Oh, that's a big honor. Thank you. Sure. Be Bye. well. All right, folks. Um, I, again, seriously get these pieces there there's a set of them and they're you could read them all in an afternoon honestly like probably a lot of people watching this like to read and like to dive into stuff but this is one of these ones where it's like you probably don't need much more than this to be honest uh right. this abc series by vivek just and there's stuff. probably a lot of friends who may be looking for guidance in crazy times like these that has time to read something short it's perfect Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Just that clear Marxism really can just and and you know all of these the, the commonality of like the Vac and Adolf Reed and Cornell West. It just it's like the clarity. It's just mm -hmm. boom, you know. Yeah, and I, I was just gonna say, return to those fundamentals is so freaking important because you can get so bogged down and you know, certain debates that you think are very, very important. And then when you're sort of tasked with actual like political actions or movements and what your strategy is going to be, you realize that a lot of this kind of stuff that's more up in the clouds or technical, you know, it starts to evaporate how important it is. And going back to those fundamentals, what's the capitalist relationship? What is labor? Those kind of things is so important to be able to jump back into. Well, speaking of the fundamentals, let's do the gem, brother. All right. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty important story and we've been sort of actually talking. i i apologize david do you think for the new people you could just give a second and explain what the gem is yeah of course um you know the gem is a segment that i've been doing for about a year and a half now uh, where we're taking you know a kind of marxist analysis to the coverage of financial news um so we're using resources like wall street journal financial times that really are going in depth into the machinations of capitalism 
but we're building, we're, we're bringing like a Marxist uh, class-based analysis to this. Uh, so while people who read the Financial Times are usually reading this to figure out how they want to move their money around, we're reading this to say, okay, what is actually happening um, with like the captains of global industry and how does that going to affect everyday uh, workers and how can we build analysis that helps liberate people? Is sort of, you know, the general idea. Awesome. I think that's a great description. All right. So anyway, sorry, David, no, go ahead. Course. The floor is yours. No. So, you know, this is something that is uh, very important and it's something that hits on uh, a goal of mine that I think that we need to be doing a lot better on uh, as, as the left, uh, which is recognizing the in, in immense amount of labor that goes into the products that you uh, consume on a daily uh, basis and showing more solidarity uh, with the folks who do that critical labor. Um, so there's been a very important uh, story that's really been developing over the past few months, but it's starting to hit um, ahead, uh, which is what's been going on with all of the estimated around 2 million seafarers um, who work in the maritime industry, who are shipping your products all around the world. Uh, so amount, around like 80% of global trade um, is still shipped, still goes over the sea um, to get to you. And coronavirus has hit that industry particularly hard. Um, not only do people really are really relying on that industry, uh, the workers have been basically stranded on their boats um, for a significant amount of time. So now technically um, or traditionally, people who work on those kind of like long voyage vessels, they are only allowed to work for around 11 months total. And now as we uh, you know, creep into the middle of June, a lot of these folks are coming towards 15 months and 11 months is already like the high end of, of the spectrum. And there's a few reasons that this is happening. Um, but just to give you some of the numbers, you know, there's around 400,000 crew who are stranded either at sea um, or they're stuck at home because their travel restrictions that have been put in place because of COVID are preventing them from traveling uh, to the, the ports or, or their, you know, their next destination. So very like just last week, a German owned tanker refused to sail unless it received a replacement crew. Um, so a lot of these workers and their representatives have, you know, agreed that they would go go forward with some kind of extension past the norm uh, for how long they would be on a boat, understanding that it was a global crisis. But now they're approaching the end of that deal. So on June 16th, um, there's going to have to be a massive, you know, renegotiation for a lot of these contracts uh, for workers. And there's one, the, um, you know, the human question, the humanitarian question, which is like, how are we going to take care of all of these workers? And then there's two, the global economic question, which is, you know, how can we make sure that all of this, all of the goods and services that we rely upon, how are they going to be serviced with the, uh, the raw materials that they need to continue? Um, so as I said, you know, 80% of these uh, goods are taken overseas. The biggest problem right now is a lot of these seafarers, there are no entry or exit visas. So they oftentimes have been stuck in port, unable to uh, unload their cargo, or um, they're stuck, you know, in Asia and they need to get back to the United States and because they can't enter the port to get to the, uh, you know, to go to an airport, fly back across um, the sea, they're basically stuck on these boats. Um, you know, and as I said, a lot of these people have been out there for 15 months. So, you know, this is an international crisis, but there's, a, you know, there's some very important American unions. And I just wanted to uh, read a little bit from a, a letter uh, that six uh, U.S. maritime unions, including the Seafarers International Union, uh, put out to the Trump administration. Um, so this is from that letter. As ships, captains, officers, and crew members who sail under the American flag and perform these essential functions for our countries have not been able to set foot on dry land in months. Their workplaces have become floating prisons. Crew members are in danger of losing access to life-sustaining medicines. In many cases, they cannot contact their loved ones at home in the United States as some of these vessels lack internet access. And later on in the letter, uh, they say, it is inconceivable that the United States, the wealthiest and most powerful nation on earth, with military bases, planes, and facilities all over the globe, cannot rel relieve its own mariners um, who are stranded at sea. To date, however, our efforts to address this problem with members of your uh, respective departments have yielded no results. That's why we're bringing this issue to your attention. So th this is something that we need to be uh, trying to amplify this actual serious crisis of the humanitarian crisis of these people who have been stuck on their boats for so long and all of these other workers who basically are, are prepared and want to work and want to continue the crucial work that they do, which is keeping the entire uh, global system 
um, running, uh, we need to be doing the kind of solidarity work that we can with them to make sure that this becomes a major issue. I mean, the, basically what the unions have been calling for is that they need to have a special global, international like protected class. Uh, none of the ships that are covered by the American unions have any uh, uh, reported cases of COVID, um, but yet they're not able to enter into other countries to be able to access those uh, airports, right? So they're asking that they are given an international status that allows them um, to be able to move um, across the globe as they need um, to you know, facilitate this crucial work. And you know, it could hit a, a pretty serious labor dispute. Um, just lastly, I just also wanted to quote uh, Steve Cotton, who's the General Secretary of the International Transport Workers Federation. Um, he says, if you don't know when you're going to get off a ship, that adds to a high level of anxiety that really is quite demoralizing. And he said, unless governments facilitate crew changes, um, he's warning, it's difficult for us to convince the seafarers not to take more dramatic action and stop working. Um, so this is going to be a very critical question if the Trump administration and all these international governments don't step up and take care of these, uh, these people, these workers whose labor literally um, maintain a, a functioning global economy. Um, so this is something to be watching over the next few days and trying to raise more awareness because for so many people, I mean, this is the kind of work that's critical to our system, but it, it's, you know, it's on the ocean. You don't see it happening every day. It's sort of, you know, it's happening in the back of your mind. It's not front and center. And we really need to be making sure that these people, one, are appreciated and two, are shown solidarity by uh, the international and the U.S. left. Absolutely. How much of work that we rely on, we don't even see. Oh, Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's something to be extremely mindful of if you're in a position where, you know, there's work that, you know, it, it expresses itself as, you know, like on the house, as it were. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's so much labor that goes into every everything that you touch, uh, even from, you know, commodities that you just use to, to mess around with, like, you know, gaming systems, things like that. The amount of people, the amount of labor that goes into every product, you like Richard Wolf has talked about this. If you actually try to like slowly quantify, okay, the plastics, the chips, you know, all of these different things, um, you know, it would go on almost, uh, you know, to an incomprehensible level. So there's so much work that is critical to our system and people really should you know, spend a little bit of time, not just appreciating it in a spiritual way either. I mean, though that's important personally, right? But really like recognizing that as much as people are trying to say that like we're entering into like a post work world or something like that, that no, you know, a lot of stuff really still is done by human, human labor and that needs to be understood politically um, and economically too. Oh, no kidding. I mean, it's funny, there's an intervention. I agree with you. It shouldn't just be appreciated at the spiritual level of abstraction, but there is um, there is a Buddhist meditation practice, a uh, metta practice of cultivating love and kindness, which is a very powerful practice and will show you a lot of anxiety and a lot of limits. But the way it was taught to me at different points, it, 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 it can become almost... It, it actually gives you exactly that training in a meditative setting to like look right. at or contemplate like, Hey, your lunch, think of all of the human beings that made that possible. Then think of the ecology that made that possible. And mm -hmm. you can actually, you know, you can practice that in an extremely grounded way. It will give you a different experiential frame for looking at things. But of course, then it needs to translate into action for sure. I, I, I just wanted to add, I've been thinking about this a couple of times on the show. I've never mentioned it before. This is a little like French new wave, but there's a really fun uh, Godard film called Weekend. And it's yeah. a comedy, it's a dark comedy, but it's basically like this bourgeois couple from Paris and they want to go to the beach for the weekend. And essentially what's happening as they're going on this trip is all of the violence that they basically sit upon. So from like the colonialism to like the labor exploitation, all this stuff, it just like comes right in front of their face. So like they go to buy a Coca-Cola and there's a man who's just like bleeding, right? From like being whipped and just like hands them the Coca-Cola and stuff. Anyways, it's like, obviously it's a very extreme example, but it, it was a really interest. it's a really interesting kind of like metaphor um, to start to like think about like, Jesus Christ, there's so much injustice and 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 also like labor and things that should be valorized as well that go into like our everyday lives that it's so easy to not be aware of it and it's on purpose by the way too that you're not aware of it as well right did you ever watch the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie 
No, I haven't. It's another, uh, no, I think it's Bunuel. That's another extremely like, it's not French, I think. I don't remember. I think he's Spanish. Spanish, I think. Yeah, yeah Bunuel. I watched that years ago, but it's like, <laughs> it's so bizarre. But again, it's just on this continuum of like, there were budgets for these like lefty bohemian extremely <laughs> abstract european filmmakers in the 70s and the 60s and yeah. 70s to just make like i mean probably on some level like you know fuck you dad or fuck you dinner party guest movies but it is just like the only like it's a brilliant movie and it's just obscene like the, yeah. it's just and 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 it's just like all of like and they're, they have a buddy who, like, one of the guys in the circle is, like, an ambassador from some, like, Latin American dictatorship. And he's, like, very, you know, like, they all are, like, charmed by him. And he's having an affair with one of their wives. But then he also, like, shoots demonstrators out of the embassy window. Just, mm-hmm. like, you know, and that's just, like, part of his, like, oh, look at that. Like, he's such a good marksman. <laughs> it's such a... <laughs> there's a, these movies are worth watching no they yeah. definitely like some of those are really they can really change your perspective even if you think that you're already uh you know radical or left wing <laughs> yeah not quite um 60s spanish film but i was watching uh bar rescue this weekend what is that? there's this bar <laughs> rescue is this guy named john taffer who goes to, to like failing bars and like tells them how to like wash their stuff and how not to waste yeah. booze Gotcha. Um, and it's it's very addicting but there's this great episode where this guy comes in and he talks to who he thinks is the owner but then it turns out that guy's just a manager and he, he like the he didn't have the paperwork go through to actually own the thing so the owner starts a real owner comes in anyway it devolves into the guy who thought originally was the owner having to compete with like the workers choice for manager as to be the manager and so he goes from owner to manager to losing his job he's the only person i've seen fired on that show and it was just oh, amazing because wow. like, <laughs> this guy emerged it was like this volleyball bar in like tucson <laughs> and this, this, guy, amazing. this guy emerged and everyone's like yeah he should totally be the he should totally be the manager um the other guy just sits up in the office the entire like for 16 hours a day and i mean it's great and just like so like, yeah, I, I don't spiritualize work just for work's sake, but in relation to like management and ownership, you can mm-hmm. spiritualize uh, labor, I think. Oh, yeah. I can spiritualize plenty. Um, I just want to talk about one more story we'll cover and then we're going to go uh, to the post game in a few minutes. But um, this is reco- uh, covered by the Jacobin. I mentioned this in the interview with Vivek. I, I just think this is extraordinary um, and really, really exciting. Uh, longshore workers on the east and west coast are stopping work today to demand an end to racist police murders. Um, and it's an interview uh, Eric Blanc uh, did with um, one of the organizers uh, of this protest. Uh, Jackman's Eric Blanc spoke with one of the protest organizers, Clarence Thomas, former Secretary Treasury of ILWU Local 12 about the action and the need for labor unions to take a lead in the struggle against police violence and racism. As a resolution calling for this action that explains, all lives will matter when black lives matter because an injury to one is an injury to all. And then I'll just read briefly. Why did ILWU decide to organize this work stoppage today? Fighting police murder and white supremacy is a class question. Let's not forget that the vast majority of black people and vast majority of victims of police repression are working class. For many years, the ILWU and Local 10 in particular have been protesting racist policing of African Americans. And we understand understand that the way these murders can be stopped is when there are economic consequences. The working class has leverage and we need to use it. We think the most effective way to stop police terror is by the working class taking action at the point of production. If the working class is going to be heard, labor must shut it down. That's why today at 9 a.m. Pacific time, all longshore locals on the West Coast will be taking an eight minute, 46 second moment of silence in memory of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other victims of racist police terror. I also understand that the ILA, the Longshore Union on the East Coast will be taking similar action. We believe that labor should strive to be at the vanguard of all social struggles because we understand that labor is a responsibility to fight for those beyond just our own membership. Think about the demand of the eight hour workday and the elimination of child labor. 
there were demands that sent that unions a century ago won for the whole working class. It's that kind of spirit we need to revive today. I want to leave our uh, main part of the show on that note. Not much to add to that. That's beautiful. That's inspiring. Um, incredibly moving. And the strategic focal point, like Vivek is talking about, that wave, that strategic capacity that workers have, this is, you know, it's the potential Achilles heel of capital. And it is still a venue. Uh, it is still a possible tip of the spear for a, an actuality democratized world. So just extraordinary and nothing more to add. I definitely read the piece. Mm. That's great. All right. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to, uh, we'll probably be back in about 15 minutes. We're going to be in the post game. We're going to be talking with Ben Burgess, Joshua Khan Russell. Joshua Khan Russell's got a lot of updates from the actions in the Bay Area, as well as another organizing lesson for everybody, which I'm quite excited about. Um, and we've got some clips to get to of Cornell West, Ronnie Casrules, um, and uh, just got, I won't read it because I haven't asked uh, permission, but we've got a letter from a patron about his personal connection to the tearing down of that statue of the slave owner, slave trader in Bristol. Holston. Uh, uh, Holston. One of the most moving letters I've received. And, uh, you know, this is happening. King Leopold is down. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I would strongly Check recommend read. Yeah, King Leopold's Ghost is an incredible book. We speak about book recommendations. That's Adam Hochschild, right? Or Adam Hochschild's King Leopold's Ghost is a fantastic book and it will teach you not only about, I mean, just the unbelievable evil of Belgium in the Congo, but also um, even about some of the origins of like human rights work, some of the very positive, but also really contradictory impulses of that. Um, modern PR, colonial competition. I mean, this is, King Leopold's Ghost, that's, uh, that, speaking of book wrecks I haven't done yet, I'd strongly recommend everybody read King Leopold's Ghost. That's a great book. So we're going to talk about all of that. And the way you can join us to talk about all that is by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash TMBS, as well as getting a whole massive boatload of everything else. Spread the word, share the show, hit the like button. Thank you for the super chats. Uh, upcoming shows uh, with Cedric Johnson uh, on in on basically beyond the technical fix to policing and also his critique of whiteness studies. Uh, really looking forward to that. We just did a two part illicit history of Pakistan with these long wars who blogs from Karachi. I'd recommend everybody read his blog. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff, of course, that you have access to. So thank you to everybody for making this possible. Thank you to Vivek Chibber. Definitely check out all of his indispensable work. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, David. We'll see you guys in about 15 minutes on the post game.